Hello, everyone. My name is Michelle Meyer Shipp, and I'm the Chief People and Culture Officer at Major League Baseball. I'm really excited to be here with you all today for this discussion. We're hosting our unfiltered series with you today, and this is our featured speaker series on diversity, equity, and inclusion topics. Here we seek to raise awareness, education, and insights on really key topics that matter from a diversity and inclusion perspective. This is the fourth year in a row that we're hosting this program. The session that we're going to have right now is called GM Chronicles. This is a fireside chat wherein we're gonna to talk to a senior baseball executive to understand what it's like on the inside from the front lines of our sport. Today, you have the pleasure of being joined by my friend and colleague, Tony Regans. Tony Regans is the former general manager of the Angels, and he's currently MLB's chief baseball development officer. He's gonna share a little bit of his story, his journey, and his insights with everyone today. So again, you can hear about life from the inside perspective of baseball. Tony is joined by our friend Eduardo Perez, a baseball analyst at ESPN. And Eduardo is no stranger to this conversation as he's led three former discussions in the GM Chronicle series. So with that, I want to say thank you in advance to Tony and Eduardo. And I want to turn it over to you, Eduardo. Thank you so much for leading this conversation. This time it's a little bit different. We're doing it virtual style. We're doing it with Tony Regans, one of my really good, um, I want to say acquaintances and friends in the game because we met a little bit different than everyone, uh, I would say, than all the others. And I was signed by the California, then the California Angels in 1991, the draft of 91. And then by 1993, I get to the big leagues and I see a smiling face and Tony Regan's trying to figure out, how am I going to get this newbie, this rookie, <laughs> to sign these baseballs for me? And uh, Tony, how did you start? How did you get involved in baseball? <laughs> You know, I think back at those times, man, and those were those were great times. That was like really when I was, you know, understanding the innocence of the game and and getting guys to sign baseballs, which, you know, being a newbie, like you said, you know, was a tough deal because you guys were tough at that time. But um, you know, I I I was able to get in a game as an intern with the with the Angels, you know, back in 1991 and and serve that internship, you know, by you know, being fortunate to to get the opportunity from two individuals, one, John Savano, who, who passed away and was, you know, really instrumental in me getting the opportunity to to be a part of the organization, and Billy Bavese, who, who now works at, at Major League Baseball. And he gave me really the opportunity, you know, along with Jeff Parker, the opportunity to get on the baseball side of the business. So without those two, two individuals, you know, I, I'm hard pressed to be able to get a, a job in the industry. Um, but, you know, things worked out and, um, you know, everybody has a journey and, and, and mine started uh, as an intern with the, with the angels. And I think at that time I was, and I think still am the first uh, African American that started as an intern in the game and ended up running a club. You go to Indio high, you grew up in Indio. California, and you're able to then go get your bachelor's at the College of the Desert. Then you move over to Cal State Fullerton. You get your marketing degree there. When did you know, okay, I'm going to go after this internship in baseball, not having played baseball even in high school, being that football star that you were on the way to Oregon State, things changed for you in a drastic way. You know, I wanted to make sure that one, the most important thing was get my college degree. And the number two was I wanted to go to a school that, that valued baseball. Cal State Fullerton was one of them. Obviously that team with, with uh, Coach Garrido, uh, you know, those guys were a powerhouse. So, you know, I would go to games there, you know, and um, go to class. And yeah, I graduated. I was on the, on the brink of graduating and a buddy of mine, Kevin Van. He said, hey, man, the Angels are, are giving out internships, man. You gotta, We need to go over there. And so so Kevin and I, we uh, it was a Monday. I'll never forget. It was a Monday, and we went down to, to Angel Stadium and went into the press box there, and there was about 300 people in the press box 
vying for 10 internships. And, <laughs> and uh, I was just fortunate to be able to be, you know, one of the 10. And again, John Savano just happened to be walking by at the time I was speaking and um, introducing myself and talking about what I wanted to do in life. And he told me to come back and, and uh, offer me the internship. And, you know, I was on my way. It was a non-paying internship. Just want to make sure you understand that. So you did a non-paying internship for two seasons with the Angels? Non-paying. The second year, I have to say, they said I did such a good job that they wanted to give me $500 as a bonus. So for two years, I made $500. (laughs) And becoming a general manager now for the Angels, you then join an elite class of Bill Lucas, who was the first general manager of the Atlanta Braves, and Bob Watson served two terms, actually, of, of general managing. And, uh, with, uh, and then after that, you get Kenny Williams, and you become the fourth general manager. After that, we got Mike Hill and Dave Stewart. So a total of six African-American general managers in the game. You were the fourth one. Um, did that set in at all once you were named, knowing, wow, I'm opening door. I'm continuing to open, uh, opening doors moving forward? It did. It, it did. It, it, um, it resonated in a big way. Um, you know, prior to that, you know, I, I didn't think that I would get an opportunity to, to do it. I just, I didn't. Um, and it was back, I think it was 2000. Um, and Kenny, Kenny Williams, you know, he got the opportunity to, to be the GM of White Sox. And I thought maybe this is possible, you know, and I had been in meetings and farm director meetings with, with, uh, with Kenny and, and I saw that he got the shot. Right. And so I'm just thinking, you know, maybe at some point down the line, maybe it's, maybe it's a chance things are going to, you know, have to fall in the right place, but maybe I have an opportunity to do this, but do what you do best. And that's, you know, work on what you're working on at that moment. And, and do the best that you can do. And that's what I, that's what I focused on. And um, I was just fortunate that Bill Stoneman um, relied on me at that time to, um, to really go to the owner, um, Artie Moreno, and um, <laughs> you can see him now, and, um, and, say, and recommend me as the general manager of, of, of the Angels. So it was a cool time. And um, I look back at those th- that time. It was uh, it was it was pretty awesome. Wait a second, wait a second. Right there, I just saw Tory Hunter in 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 one of the the clips there, and I, I have to I have to go to this. I have to I have to attack this right then and there. Give me the backstory of how you were able to sign Tory Hunter, and, and I did my homework, so I need that backstory. I need the I need the chalupa, the taco. <laughs> I need to know what you had on the menu. Yeah, so at that time it was um, it was Thanksgiving Eve, and you know we had talked uh, briefly. Larry Reynolds, who represented Tory, and you know I knew Tory's career, knew knew um, you know what kind of guy he was, what kind of leader he was, and one of the things that sold me on his leadership is how he. Um, he got in the face of his own teammates, you know, in the dugout because they weren't going at it hard. And for me, I think leadership was, was extremely important. And uh, I knew that Tory was that type of leader. And so Thanksgiving Eve, we, um, I talked to Larry Reynolds and I'd say, Hey, Larry, I mean, we're interested in, uh, in Tory. And, and he had, Tory had been talking to a bunch of other clubs and, um, and I said, Hey, Hey, Larry, we're, we're interested in, um, you know, let's meet up. And Larry said, are you serious? He said, are you serious, man? I said, uh, Larry, let's do it. And he said, uh, well, let's do it. I said, well, let's, let's meet. And so, so Thanksgiving Eve in California on the 91 freeway, for those that know, um, you know, it's traffic is jam packed. So my, I was in, I was in Orange County and Larry was in Riverside. And so halfway in between Riverside and Riverside and Orange County was this Del Taco and Corona, which was the midpoint. I said, let's go. And the fact that Larry accepted that meeting and Tori was going to be on the call. And I told him we're going to meet at this Del Taco. 
um, I knew that Tori didn't care about going to, you know, Mastro's for dinner or me whining and dining him. All he cared about was winning and he wanted to be a part of the angels. And so that told, I knew driving down there, I knew we were going to get the deal done because Tori was that committed to being an angel. And so we got the deal done probably in, I don't know, maybe an hour. I tried to call Tim me, uh, and, and after we wrapped it up and Tim was in Las Vegas at some show and I couldn't call him for a couple of hours and he finally called me back and I said, Hey Tim, you know, we, we got this deal done. So, uh, get ready for an announcement tomorrow morning. So it was kind of cool. Uh, Artie did, did, did great. He, uh, he gave me the flexibility to be able to get the deal done. Uh, but it came together together rather quickly. And, um, I just, I was just really excited about the fact that Tori, he didn't have to be wind and dying. I didn't have to go flying all around the country to go meet him. I did that, you know, but I didn't have to go flying him all around the country to go meet this guy. He wanted to get the deal done and we got it done that night. Okay. So what did you order? <laughs> the story, the $90 million he signed for, what did you eat? <laughs> didn't even eat. I didn't even eat. I had, uh, I think I had an iced tea. I think Larry might have had a bean burrito or something, but <laughs> we didn't even eat. We were, we were, we were serious. We were getting it done. Take me through the drafting of Mike Trout and when he got to where he got in the first round. Um, so deep into it, were you guys? This is a no-brainer. This is who we're taking. Or in that war room, was there debate? Maybe not Trout. Maybe someone else. <laughs> You know, we, the story, it, it's kind of funny because the story kind of, it's like, you know, the big fish tail and, and, and sometimes the story changes, but you know, how it went down was, uh, you know, Eddie Bain did a great job and, and, and you can, I could never say, um, Eddie didn't do a great job, but Greg Moorhart, who was the area scout, I think the drafting of Mike Trout was the perfect, perfect example of how, an organization should should go about it, uh, drafting a player, drafting and signing a player. Uh, Greg Mohart, who, who was the area scout, had a great relationship with uh, with Mike's dad. Mike was from the Northeast. Um, not a lot of clubs kind of, you know, bear down on, uh, on, on guys from the Northeast because of, obviously, it's the Northeast. But Greg knew him really well. And when I talked to Greg about Mike, and this was – in the, in the draft room or just after Greg, had, Greg told me, I actually were on the phone call and Greg told me, he said that this was the best player that he'd ever seen in his life. And, um, he's going to be a major leaguer and he's going to be an all-star for all-star for many, many years to come. And you talk to, to area scouts and, and sometimes they sell their players and they want you to take, get their player. So, but, Eddie, Eddie was convicted in trial. Um, a lot of our staff was convicted in, tra in trial. We had a lot of players on our board uh, that were ahead of trial. Uh, you know, Strasburg obviously was coming out that same year. But um, Eddie was convicted, um, and he did, the, he did the right thing. He, he was the one that said, hey, we're going to do it this way. Uh, and... And I said, hey, we got to get him signed. I told him, I said that, you know, the main thing is we take him. Uh, at the time, we were like a club that was sticking the slot, the slot value no matter what. I said, we take him, we got to get him signed. And, um, you know, being able to get him done was really, um, that was probably the toughest part of it. Taking him wasn't the toughest part because I don't know how we weren't, really sure what it was going to take to get him signed. Uh, but we were able to work it out and get him. And, 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 and really the fact of the matter is the reason why he got signed is Mike wanted to play. Mike wanted to play. He wanted to come out and play and, and show what he can do. And, uh, and he did it. He came out. I think he was, I think his dad tells a story that, you know, he was driving him crazy. He's like, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. You know, get the angels on the phone. So, so part of that, all of that kind of played into it. But um, once we were able to, you know, during the draft process, we took, everybody says, hey, you took Randall Gritchick before uh, you took Trout. And, you know, the thinking was, we just didn't know if we were going to be able to get Trout at the number we needed to get him. Get him. 
And so we were able to get Randall done. We knew that we were going to be able to get that done. So we took Randall and we had to pick right after Randall and, and we took Trout and, you know, things obviously. And, and, and there were some, some, some dudes after that too, that we took that, that year. And, uh, you know, Pat Corbin being one of them, you know, the guys that, you know, still in the big leagues that, that are, are doing well, Tyler Staggs, you know, all those guys that, uh, that uh, part of that draft was probably one of our, you know, better drafts ever. Um, I wish we could have followed that up in 2010 with uh, equally as good a draft. We didn't do so well in 2010, um, and we had a, a number of picks. I think if we would have been able to go back to back with with that type of draft like we had in 2009, uh, the Angels, you know, system would have been stacked for years. So, um, but things work out. Like I said, you own every decision, um, the good ones and the bad ones. And I don't call them bad decisions, I, the good ones and, and the challenging ones, the ones that don't work out because, you know, every GM is going to have a tough decision and want some that doesn't, doesn't work out, but, um, you own every single one of them. And I, and that's what I do and, and, and did. Uh, and to this day, I own every one of them. And, and, and Trout's just one that, uh, you know, we're fortunate to be able to say, Hey, this guy's probably going to end up being one of the best players in the history of the game. And um, to, to be able to be a part of that, you know, it's kind of cool. I, I had the honor of working alongside Jessica Mendoza at ESPN, breaking down baseball games as an analyst. She's a, she's a pioneer in her field. Um, you had the same, um, the same fortune of working alongside King Ng, who just got hired uh, by the Miami Marlins as the, the next general manager. Give me a little bit of how it, is, how it was to work alongside Kim, who has been instrumental in promoting the game of baseball and softball to young ladies, especially me having two daughters. Um, it's uh, it's a very personal, uh, it's very personal, especially me here living in Miami. I get to see what the media and the fan base says about her, which so far has been stellar reviews. Yeah, it just goes to Kim's like mentality and her her approach and her professionalism. She was, you know, deal, dealing with um, you know, the major leagues major league side for a number of years, and and so she came to to, to my department in my area, and she was deal, dealing with young people. Um, and she was she you know pictures shown here. She's out in front speaking to a girls baseball uh, group uh, with our grit program. And she she took to um, our softball program and and she oversaw that and she was a leader. Um, she jumped in and she's intelligent. She's bright. Um, she's smart. She's capable. And you know when when she told me that uh, she was interviewing with the Marlins, um, I was just I was excited for her and I knew that she had had tried and you know had been denied many times but she kept she kept at it she kept grinding and, and you know kind of like my career back in the day you have to keep going you have to keep moving forward and and when the opportunity comes be prepared and you know you hear and we read that she's the first gm or female gm in the history of the game which is awesome and i just say kim is as capable and as qualified as any male GM, you know, in the game. And I don't look at her as a female GM. I look at her as a GM because I know, you know, what she's capable of. I know her intellect. I know her background. She's seen it all on the baseball side. Um, and so um, I think she's going to do a great job down there in Miami. And she's going to, um, she's going to do well. She's going to do well because she, she's going to keep, she's going to keep grinding. And, um, yeah, you know, I think that's what it takes, and you got to grind every day. And uh, I told her, I said, uh, you got to stop doing all these interviews because uh, uh, you know it's time to go now. You got to show what you can do. So she's uh, she's going to do a great job. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate so far you taking your time doing this interview. Um, and the way I found out that Kim was hired was actually my 17 year old daughter. Uh, she came into the room. And uh, saw it on the Instagram saying, Kimmy just got hired. Kim just got hired here in Miami. And uh, uh, it, was, it was really cool. And how do you see that inspiring other young ladies uh, to be able to get roles, um, important um, executive roles in the game? 
I think it just opens up doors. I think that, you know, a lot of times, and, you know, I'll just go back to what I know and like with Kenny Williams, right. For me, I just didn't think that there was an opportunity. I just didn't see people in that role. Uh, you know, Bill Lucas and, and, uh, had, you know, he was older, Bob Watson, older, had, hadn't really seen them in that role. And when I looked at, and, and I'm sure, you know, young ladies hadn't seen a female GM before. And so now that, that Kim's been able to, to kind of break through that, that ceiling, I think young ladies are going to be extremely passionate about getting to that level. They know that this is feasible. It's, it's, it, I, I, I can do it if I work hard. And if things work, work in the right way and things fall in place, it could be me. And so I think that Kim's this opportunity for Kim is going to have a lasting impact on our game because she is uh, she's going to do a good job. And, you know, I think that, you know, and we've heard from a lot of the, the young ladies that are in our programs how excited they are for Kim because they got to interact with her and they know that she's capable. And I think a lot of them think that, hey, if I'm not the GM, maybe it's I'm assistant GM or maybe I'm a farm director or maybe I'm a scouting director, but those doors are starting to open up. And so I think that, you know, we're going to hear more from a lot of young ladies uh, in our game. Obviously we have uh, young ladies on the field or ladies on the field now, uh, but uh, in front offices and, and on the baseball side, I think that's going to keep coming down the line. You know, every year we talk about, uh, the lack of African-American presence on the field in Major League Baseball. Uh, when, when is this going to start turning? What, what are we doing? What are we doing to make these numbers go up as far as representation of the African-American player on the field? You know, I, I look at it and, you know, we, we just had two African-Americans become uh, the rookie of the year last year. 2020, you know, we had uh, a lot of success in the draft in terms of the last five years, guys going in the first round, probably 20% of 18 to 20% of the guys going in the first round were African-American. Um, and, and, but the game is, is it's, it's not as accessible to the African-American youngster as it is to to um, a lot of the other nationalities, and I'm just going to say nationalities. But uh, when I look at, you know, the, the the showcase circuit, the high profile, you know, scouting events, a, a lot of the African American players aren't aren't represented there, and and so you know when you look at college, and 70 percent of the players getting drafted every year are from college, and you don't you have three percent, you know, African Americans in college. You know, the numbers just don't add up. And so creating those opportunities, programs like the ones that we've uh, we've established, you know, Breakthrough Series, Dream Series, Hank Aaron, um, those are important. Getting African-American players in the high-profile showcases where, you know, you know all the other high-talented uh, players are is important. Investment, um, you know, financial investment in, in the African-American community is important. Um, you know, I just look at it like if you look at, you know, how we've been able to invest in, in, in the Dominican, you know, probably 30 percent of the players um, at the at the major league level are from are from Latin America and about what seven to eight percent are African-American. So our game is diverse. Uh, no question about it. Um, it is extremely diverse. Uh, but that type of investment um we should look to try to do more at, in the African-American community. And I think that's one of the things that I'm really focused on is more investment in the African-American community. And then going back to old school scouting, um, you know, those are, those are one of the other things that, 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 you know, the Eric Davises, the Daryl Strawberries, you know, a lot of those guys are still around, but they're playing basketball and playing football. Um, and, and um, you know, our scouts are, 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 are doing it. We're seeing a lot of video, a lot of, a lot of video now. And if you're not getting, you know, videoed and, 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 and taped and, and you're not being seen, you know, your chances of getting into pro ball are probably, you know, they're getting minimized. So 
I, I think we have to do those things um, in addition to we need more scholarships in, 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 in college, you know, 11.7 scholarships, you know, and the other, other, other programs, basketball and football are full rides and, you know, everybody has a scholarship and our game doesn't. So, I mean, those are all issues that, that face us that we need to, you know, to continue to kind of push because those are, those are what are going to make, you know, the presence of the African-American player at the major league level, those numbers go up. So, uh, there's a lot of work to be done, Eduardo. Um, you know what, what's what's going on in Puerto Rico and 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 how uh, those players have been impacted. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of work, and you know we're committed to doing the work. We just have we have to do it and keep uh, keep grinding. Wow, that that was uh, well said, uh, Tony. I want to thank you for being on our fourth annual GM Chronicles here, Eduardo. Man, thanks for having me. Enjoyed it. Uh, uh, keep doing what you're doing, man. You're doing an awesome job. Appreciate you.